Good morning. Thank you for coming to today's uh, seminar. The title of today's seminar is Making Sense of Confusion Practice in Joseon. Um, the basic underlying uh, questions uh, for today's seminar is how knowledge was put into practice uh, in medieval Korea, specifically during the period of Joseon Dynasty, and what was the content and significance of this confusion practice in the process of Korean history. Okay, so let's start. Contents, uh, we have introduction first, and then uh, we have chapter one, the neo confusion framework, order and identity. This is about the theoretical basic information to understand confusion practice in Joseon. The following two chapters, chapter 2 and chapter 3, uh, will uh, treat the specific content and meaning of Confucian practice in uh, Joseon period. The chapter 2 is order in Confucian practice, and chapter 3 is identity in Confucian practice. In the last chapter, chapter 4, making sense of Confucian practice in Joseon. In this chapter, I will present a comparative perspective and analysis uh, to have a wider and deeper understanding of Confucian practice in the period of Joseon. And then we will finish with conclusions. Okay, let's move to introduction. Um, Topically speaking, uh, today's seminar has two big general parts or questions. So two big topics to be discussed. The first is the characteristic of confusion practice in Joseon. The characteristics, uh, natures, importance, meaning, uh, context of confusion practice in Joseon. The second more general part or questions throughout this seminar is the relationship between knowledge and practice, or say interaction, interaction between knowledge and practice in uh, Joseon. So how did the production of knowledge involve social engagement in Joseon? So as I said, this is about the interaction or connection between knowledge and practice, or even uh, we can go further to say uh, we will explore more about the conjuncture and disrupture of knowledge and practice. By doing so, we will have more comparative uh, perspective to uh, make a comparison between Confucian practice in Joseon and uh, other intellectual practice in other areas of the world. So with these two general large items in mind, let us go to chapter one. Okay, chapter one, Neo-Confucian Framework, uh, Order and Identity. <coughs> this is, as I said, is the part theoretical, regarding the theoretical uh, framework and information on to understand Confucian practice in Joseon. Um, Confucian scholars, specifically the Neo-Confucian scholars, believe that there is a world unseen, the world that uh, we can experience, we can feel, we can touch. But still, they believe that there is a general grounding, a basic law of this unseen, the world unseen. That's what they call the ultimate or Tai Chi or Taeguk. So Taeguk is the law of the world unseen. At the same time, uh, Confucian scholars also believe that there is a world that we can touch, we can feel, we can experience, and we can even think about. That's what uh, they call phenomenon, this world. And of course, they believe that uh, there is the law, basic grounding uh, law 
of this law. Uh, I'm sorry, this uh, uh, this word, and that's what they call principle or li or e in Korean. And principle is again divided into two: uh, natural principle, natural principle, and social principle. So natural principle is about the principle of natural world, whereas the social principle is the principle of human society, or human community, or say social world. And this one, the second one, social principle has morality or ethics. They believe that this social principle has to be, should be moral or ethical. And that's very important, different from natural principle. And uh, when we narrow down uh, this social principle, then again, social principle is divided into two. The first is sinocentric world system. Uh, the principle that applies to the countries in East Asia. The principle that applies to the relationship, in a more specific terms, among the countries in East Asia. So this and this Sino-Central world system has the leader. The leader is China, and then there are followers uh, of that big brother China. Yeah? Uh, so what uh, we should uh, notice here is this world system and this social principle has a hierarchy or order as a very basic elements of its own. And then the second part of this social principle uh, is Joseon system. So the principle within Joseon, the principle that applies to Joseon, the principle that governs Joseon. Then what is that? Uh, similarly to the sign world system, it is based upon the concept and content of hierarchy or order that starts from the ruling elites and above that uh, middlemen and after middlemen and peasants and then uh, craft, uh, craftsmen or artisans and then the next is a merchant and then the bottom is composed of lower-born people or slaves. So this kind of hierarchical relationship or hierarchical system of Joseon was believed to be the principle of Joseon, which also belonged to social principle, which also belonged to principle of these phenomena. They believed that that's the basic grounding law of Joseon society. So what is noticeable is that the principle is now here equal to a hierarchy or order, or principle is now being identified with the hierarchical relationship among human beings, specifically the hierarchical relationship within Joseon. Okay. And then let's go back to this social principle. As I mentioned, social principle is based upon what? morality, ethics, then what we can say here is ethics, morality, and order, hierarchy, and principle, specific social principle, these three elements are now what? All intertwined. It. They were able to be put together okay, with one another. So this confluence, this combination is very important to start with um, confusion practice of Joseon. Okay. So this is very brief yet very important concise uh, framework, neo-confusion framework of confusion uh, practice. And the content of this neo-confusion framework uh, is based upon order and identity. Let's go more specific, chapter 2. Chapter 2, Order in Confucian Practice. Mm. The logic of Confucian practice in Joseon is based upon 
universality of principle starts from principle, universality of principle. So principle operates universally in this world, everywhere. Principle then is available and applicable throughout time and space. Throughout time and space. And by the way, the essence of principle is filial piety, hyo, xiao, and uh, loyalty, chung, or chung. Go back to principle. So principle is available and applicable throughout time and space. Therefore, what principle can be put into practice throughout Joseon too, as well as throughout time and space. And now principle is equal or equivalent to Joseon system. Then the natural conclusion will be the maintaining to maintain Joseon system or the hierarchical human relationship of Joseon will be and is a universal task or mission in Confucian practice of Joseon. So that's how the Joseon elite uh, brought out the cause for Confucian practice in Joseon. What about the content then? The, the core of Confucian practice, as I said, briefly mentioned before, is filial piety and loyalty. The first one is about order, order between father and son, or parents and son. And the second is about the order between uh, king and uh, his subjects. So first is about family. The second is about state. So self-cultivation and keeping familiar relationship was very specific, important uh, form of Confucian practice for filial piety. Whereas the second one, the Confucian statecraft, here statecraft is the art of uh, conducting um, state affairs. So uh, Confucian statecraft was another important Confucian form of in, in form of Confucian practice for uh, loyalty. In Confucian statecraft, agriculture was the core of national industry. In Confucian statecraft, the military was the core of national securities. What is more, what is more, scientific uh, disciplines such as astronomy, calendar, mathematics, horology, geography, and architecture, and technologies, including military, uh, military technologies, became a primary basis for Confucian statecraft. So here, uh, science and technology were placed under the category of Confucian statecraft. That means science, technology were part of Confucian practice in Joseon. So science and technology were not handled or treated for the sake of science and technologies, but they were used as a means of Confucian uh, practice in Joseon. Okay? That's very important point that we should keep in mind uh, for chapter two. Okay, let's move to chapter three. So Joseon State continued to promote and perform Confucian uh, practice, and uh, they went to the degree that they were able to claim that they possess, they possess, they attain. Confucian civilization of their own or Confucian practice of their own. So they were talking about the maturity, the high quality of Confucian uh, practice of Joseon itself. For instance, during and after the reign of King Sejong, Joseon State finally demonstrated a high capacity to institutionalize Confucian statecraft 
and to spread Confucian practice to the rest of the society. The representative achievements are the creation of Korean Hangul alphabet, the establishment of uh, rituals and rites, and welfare systems, and the development of arts, science, and technologies. And this is a time, this is a time when uh, Ming China uh, governed and controlled over the East Asian world system. So on the one level, there is a Sino-centric world system was operating. On the other level, then here, the Confucian practice of Joseon was, was working well under the guidance of uh, Joseon state. Uh, and at the same time, we should not dismiss uh, self-confidence, the emergence of a self-confident discourses on the Confucian practice of Joseon within the intellectual community. Uh, usually, uh, what they call as uh, discourses on our eastern realm of Confucian civilizations, uh, in Korean Adong, eh? our eastern realm of Confucian civilizations. What is that? Uh, the in there is a uh, increase of practical research among Joseon elites about the heavens, time, and space of Joseon related all to uh, Confucian statecraft of Joseon from more uh, objective perspectives. So this kind of intellectual traditional legacy is very important to understand the Confucian practice the exercise of Confucian practice in Joseon. And in the 18th centuries, the Joseon witnesses a academic and cultural renaissance revival. And this is a time when China was controlled by Qing, or we'll say Qing China. And the royal family of the Qing dynasty came originally from Manchuria. They were used to be the Jurchen people in Manchuria that were considered for a long time to be inferior to Joseon. So as a response, as a result, the Joseon state at that time and Joseon elites devised and strategized a variety of state projects and programs revitalizing and re-emphasizing the Confucian practice of Joseon, the Confucian civilization of Joseon. So along this line, the growing interest of the Joseon elite in discussing, in talking about the collective identity of Joseon in the civilized world of East Asia. Uh, so what we can see here is the ongoing affirmation by Joseon of East Asia, including Joseon, as the most civilized region from the 15th century to uh, the 18th centuries. And they were very proud of the confidence of Confucian practice of Joseon itself. Uh, what is remarkable is that throughout chapter 2 and chapter 3 is that Confucian practice was not simply what Confucian doctrines revealed itself in action. It functioned, Confucian practice functions as a socio-political and geopolitical tool, tool that could justify the domestic order or domestic hierarchical system of Joseon while magnifying the subjectivity of Joseon as an independent realm of civilization in East Asia. Okay. Yeah. So how order and uh, identity were put together in the process of performing Confucian practice within the context of Joseon is very important for us to remember. 
Okay, let's move to the last part, last chapter, making sense of Confucian practice in Joseon. In this chapter, I will talk more about a comparative analytical perspective to have a further and deeper understanding of Confucian practice in Joseon. The first question is that, um, is Confucianism in a systematic form of independent academic uh, field, uh, well, uh, state, not church nor school, uh, was the major promoters of Confucianism, Confucian doctrines, and Confucian practice in Joseon. Then what about purpose? The ultimate objective of Confucian practice of Joseon was to establish and maintain an ideal yet independent Confucian state within Sinocentric world system of East Asia. Then what about elite, Joseon elite? What about Joseon elite? <coughs> Joseon elite, not professional scholars, as in the case of the West at the time, identify themselves as Confucian scholar officers, not just a scholar, but scholar officers who conduct statecraft in government and pursue a Korean Confucian society within East Asia. Then now we can uh, think about, then what about other part of the world at that time? What about the other side of the world at that time? For instance, the contemporary uh, West, or Europe from the 16th centuries to 18th centuries. Then we can see here a line of the emergence of the line of new development in terms of exploration of the larger world beyond Europe. That's not what happened in Joseon. In terms of academic re-examination of how to define, per perceive and use knowledge in terms of epistemological changes and challenges for empirical science, in terms of social accommodations to the development of empirical research and uh, technologies, in terms of visions for new paradigms of uh, human civilizations, in terms of demands for independence of the intellectual communities. All these phenomena were taking place in the West, in the Europe, during this, this period. But that, uh, and these phenomena is not what happened in Joseon. Then what we can find here is that a different, a different uh, process of interaction or connection between uh, knowledge and practice unfolded in the West and in the East. This divergent trajectory contains differing historical pro context of these two regions. So along this line, I believe that we can learn more about where to place and how to rethink and redefine the meaning of Confucian practice in Joseon. Okay. So now we are reaching, approaching uh, to conclusions. We have observed how the development of Confucian practice in Joseon was not only inseparable from humanities, including the intellectual environment, but also was integral to a deep-seated structure of mentality, such as a collective identity of Joseon, or the Eastern realm of Confucian civilization, for instance. And this suggests that the production of knowledge required or requested social engagement in Joseon. And in this aspect, I contend that the, the development of Confucian practice in Joseon well reflected a socio-historical process. And this is the point that uh, I want to make uh, throughout this uh, seminar 
in order to compare this case of Korean uh, Confucian practice with uh, those in the other regions of the world. And that could be very uh, uh, meaningful uh, project in the future uh, for a comparative studies of intellectual histories between East and uh, West. Uh, this is the conclusion, and we have the last, last part uh, after the conclusions. A future research uh, project. My future research, thematically speaking, is also a continuation of what we have discussed so far. What happened after the 18th centuries when the East and the West came to get in touch with each other at an unprecedented level? What happened then? Okay. Dramatic period from the 19th century to the mid-centuries uh, in East, A East Asia, including uh, Korea. What happened after 18 centuries? I will focus on Han learning, the latest scholarly trend in China, in the 19th century became an intellectual form of solidarity between Korea and China even after the 19th century. In other words, after the 19th century, the intellectual collaboration and cooperations drawing on Han learning continued, I believe, into the 20th century. How? There are two research projects to uh, go further, do research on this part. Two uh, subjects. The first one is intellectual effort of Korean elites to create a modern uh, genre of aesthetics that centered on literature, philosophy, and arts by utilizing pre modern East Asian and Korean civilization as an important repertoire for diversifying the West or Japan led modern civilization imposed as universal and repertoire for generating a constructive vision for an East Asian way of modern civilizations. The second research topic for that uh, solidarity is the emergence of, uh, emergence of an antique market during the colonial period from 1910 to 1945. The Korean elite's reformulation of cultural values and aesthetic taste to uh, suit the pre-modern East Asian Korean traditions to their practical conditions. Uh, other than these two uh, topics, another big large example of Sino-Korean solidarity can be found in the changing narrative on Kija. So new interpretation on Kija, uh, who was the Chinese sage rulers, moving to uh, ancient Korea as a symbol for Sino-Korean solidarity in modern times, uh, specifically in the first half of the 20th centuries, the unfolding of the intellectual discourse on Kija, with emphasis on the Sino-Korean solidarity against Japanese colonialism before 1945, and against Chinese Communism after 1945 under the theme of Confucian tradition shared between Korea and China. So throughout the course of research on this subject as above, I will point out the intellectual practice of modern Korea able to reappropriate pre-modern East Asian civilizations specifically Confucian traditions or Confucian civilization or Confucian practice vis-a-vis -vis the global spread of modern civilizations imported from the West and Japan and able to make Korean elites themselves as significant cultural and practical intermediaries in the changing world of East Asia. So finally, in this sense, we can go back to Confucian practice in Joseon and compare the practice with the new, newer practice that took place in modern times. And then we can talk more 
about continuity and discontinuity between these two kinds of intellectual practice in Korean history. Uh, this is my tentative conclusion for the future research. And this is pretty much about it. So thank you for coming to today's seminars. Goodbye.